Good day, beautiful people. Welcome to another episode of Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. This is episode 67, and I'm joined by two very special guests. This is a special panel today because we're dedicating this conversation to Julian Assange. And I'm aware that my audience may know about Julian, but there are also millions of people in this country and around the world that still are unaware of what's going on with Julian Assange. So I thought it would be proper to bring two guests on. One is a repeat guest. Paula Ayacella, um is responsible for the Assange defense in Boston that was started along with Susan McLucas, who joined us in episodes 13 and 20. So I advise all my listeners and viewers to go back and watch those episodes 13 and 20 so everyone is filled in with all the context and the proper details leading up to, the, to where we are today. And we also have Julia Hansen, who is based in the Boston area as well. She's a climate activist. But she's also taken a very serious um, interest in this Julian Assange situation as well. And we're actually going to go over one of her articles that she published for, um, I think it's Ecori News, which yes. is based in um, southern New England. And so I just want to say welcome to both of y'all. And thanks for coming back onto the show, Paul. And thanks for meeting me for the first time, Julia. And thanks for accepting that invitation. So yeah. nice to be here, Kiko. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kiko. Um, Absolutely. And we have we have so much really to get into. Um, so we may recap some stuff that people may have heard before. But like I said, I have um, quite a few questions. Um, just puzzling things, really, honestly, at this point, because we're years into this. And um, just the lack of awareness around Julian is, um, is, is pretty perturbing. And from my standpoint, but I just want to give a slight advertisement in and say that I want people to subscribe to Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. It's free. It doesn't cost you a dime to do that. And also support independent media channels uh, such as Empathic Times with Amira Napier. She was on yesterday. We talked about Palestine, which is a very serious issue and topic. And this is a very serious issue and topic. And so those types of issues are what we try to bring awareness to on Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. And so I think if we're going to support our celebrities that we like and stuff, we need to also think about some of the smaller independent channels because we have some content that may not be available even in mainstream news and some of the more broader profiles of these people. So just keep that in mind. Um, subscribe, like if you like the content, tell your interested friends and family. We've reached 88 different countries on this forum alone. So it is possible to reach people one by one. And that's what it's going to take um, to bring awareness to all these social issues that we're faced today. And um, I urge people, if you're scared, don't be afraid. Um, you may have some blowback, but we're in times now where desperate times, desperate measures. We need to really start communicating with people and getting things off of our mind that, that we're thinking about. And maybe that affects someone else. And you may not realize the impact that you have on these people. So I wanted to introduce, um, first of all, how did you all meet um, Julia and Paula? How did you meet so the audience understands how you both kind of came to the, the whole idea around Julia and Assange in the first place? Well, I can, um, I can share how I came to the Boston area Assange defense group. Um, I have been on a lot of listservs, as I'm sure so many people in your audience have, um, of issues that I care about, but I don't necessarily read all of the emails that I get through them. But um, last May, uh, so a year and some months ago, um, I happened to open an email that came from, I believe, an MIT student group um, uh, that was calling its members to show up to a rally at Harvard University's graduation in which the attorney general Merrick Garland would be the keynote speaker at one of those events. And um, the intrepid folks um, from Boston area Assange group were there along with Jill Stein, um, basically, delivering um, thoughtful speeches to anyone who would listen outside in Harvard Square um, about the need to stand up for journalistic freedom and the freedom of Julian Assange. 
And I happened to be living close by at that point. And I kind of just like nudged my husband. I was like, should we go to this? Like, we don't go to enough protests. And, um, and like, yes, I don't know anything about this, but I feel like this is an important cause and I would like to learn more. And so I showed up, I made my own sort of scrappy homemade sign and was immediately realized that the signs that were provided by Paula and everyone else were much more professional looking. Um, and, and so I just joined in and was blown away by what I heard the speakers say. And by the fact that our very own Susan McLucas actually went inside Harvard Yard and held her sign up in front of Merrick Garland, which I thought was a very brave thing to do. And so after feeling very um, inspired by just kind of tagging along and participating in that morning's events, um, I went back home and Googled <laughs> Julian Assange and um, started reading up on um on this entire case and that led me to go back to the next time that i think it was three weeks later that paula and susan organized another rally this time outside the british consulate and um and i i was just hooked i i know that there are so many examples of injustice in our world but this particular issue really grabbed me by the heart because of how um, hypocritical and unjust it really is to be pers to be persecuting just one journalist that helped or that was key in um, publishing information about terrible war crimes that my government has committed without me knowing about it. Um, and thanks to a publisher like Julian Assange, like people know about it. Um, and so that was really the beginning of me finding courage within myself to step into the shoes of being an activist um, and inspired by Paula and Susan and others. Um, and since then, um, I have been obviously living like everyone living a very busy life but this issue just feels too important to uh to kind of suppress or ignore and so I feel like I have to take action yeah might I say that you frog forgot one small detail of that action. Oh, probably um mass peace action was also there um Brian, Brian Garvey uh, spoke so well and so clearly, and he compared the Julian Assange case to the Daniel Ellsberg case that uh, hit a special personal chord with Julia, and uh, that that started our uh, serious letter writing campaign to our representatives, uh, Senator Warren in particular, because uh, Julia was ready to just start protesting at her house. And Susan McLucas has suggested we do it, um, you know, uh, more properly and with letters, introducing ourselves. We had already written letters, but this was going to be a serious campaign because Julia was serious about it and she brought us all on board. Because uh, lobbying is not easy. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of letter writing and it's persistence. And so I thank Julia for that. It really sent us on an amazing journey this past year. I don't know if uh, yeah. Julie, you want to talk about your uncle. I love that story. And and may I just say that you, Mike Micholi was also on Kiko, correct? Mike Micholi organized that uh, uh, action protesting Merrick Garland at Harvard. And he got a lot of students involved. He asked us to co-sponsor it. We did. And Mike Micholi was on a Zoom with Randy Critico with Daniel Ellsberg. And Daniel, I've never seen Daniel Ellsberg light up as much as when he was talking to Mike. He said, oh, my gosh, I wish I had known I would have flown out there because that year, last year, was his 70th graduation from uh, Harvard. So, you know, when he said that, that gave me chills. And uh, and I really believe if, if he had known about the action, he would have flown out. So. If you want to talk more about that, Julia. 
Yes. Yeah. Be before uh, I get to that, I was going to tell, um, shout out to Mike Michioli because I knew that that was going to come up about him organizing uh, the May 29, 2022 uh, commencement. Um, Attorney General Merrick Garland was there. And um, that's actually how I found um, out about Paula because there was a photo credit uh, through the LA Progressive article that I saw. And I was like, I have to reach out to these people and try to get someone, you know, on because they're very much in the know as far as, you know, everything that's developing. And um, I'm just so glad that we were able to cross paths and, and keep this information going. Um, and just, just so the audience knows, we obviously lost uh, Dr. Ellsberg um, this past June. And so, um, we, we have to keep in mind how important uh, Daniel Ellsberg is in relation to Julian Assange um, being tried under the Espionage Act of 1917. Luckily for him, in 1971, it was thrown out the same year that they tried to get him for that because of the Vietnam War protests and everything else. And, um, and also there was a gentleman um, that you told me about that I had never heard about, a friend of his, um, Keeler. Um, that actually gave um, Daniel Ellsberg the courage to come out to release the Pentagon Papers in 1971. So um, we have a lot of people involved, Randy Keeler. So shout out to him as well. Um, but you were saying something, Julia, about your uncle. Like Paula had mentioned that. Yes, my uncle is Randy Keeler. Really? And, oh, gosh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, you obviously have. Wow. That's cool. That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I feel a very personal connection through my uncle to Dan Ellsberg. And knowing that Dan Ellsberg cared really deeply about this case was another um, push for me to look past a lot of the competing information that I found online about how. Um, you know, Assange as a national security threat. Um, because when you when you Google him, like a lot comes up, which I have since found out is simply untrue. But knowing that Daniel Ellsberg um, cared deeply about this cause um, made me all the more eager to find out the truth and to step up. That That's incredible. Um... Is this is really a small world? It is like I had no clue that you had a connection with Randy Keeler. So that's really great to know, and it also adds like it enriches the conversation even more. Absolutely, and and one thing that my uncle Randy has um, said a lot to me, especially as I've gotten a little older and have asked more questions about his experience and my my aunt, his wife uh, Betsy's experience of being lifelong peace activists, um, Randy has told me that even if what you're doing in the moment feels futile, like no one is paying attention, like it's making no difference, you never know what resonates with someone else or what could make all the difference in the issue that you're pursuing. And so he he cites the example of when he was delivering a speech in 1969, I think, to the, I hope I get the name right, Anti-War League um, in Pittsburgh, I, I believe. He didn't know that Dan Ellsberg was listening as part of the crowd. So my uncle was giving like a keynote speech or a closing speech and um. At, at that point, he knew that he would be put in prison for what turned out to be almost two years for resisting the war. Um, and so part of his speech was that he was happy to serve time um, because he knew that so many people would step into his shoes. And if enough people stepped up, they couldn't, the government couldn't imprison everybody, things would have to change. Um, and so I, you know, I've read a copy of his speech. It's a very, um, it's, it's simple really, but it was a very moving, but simple speech. And Dan Ellsberg was in the back of the crowd and cites that moment, um, 
of when he realized that he also could step from being on the Pentagon side of the Vietnam War to exposing the truth about how the government lied repeatedly to the people to, in order to justify increasing its um, um, its involvement in Vietnam. So you never know what could um, what could resonate with someone. Um, and so my uncle, you know, likes to remind me of that. And I, you know, sometimes it feels like, and I'm sure we'll get to talking about it in a bit, like trying to lobby our senators to speak up about something that should be so basic and obvious. Sometimes it feels like we're not getting any, um, make, we're not making any progress, but um, it you never know what will actually make the difference and it's important to not feel discouraged. A hundred percent. And um, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, this idea that people can change, but also people have to be exposed to those. Um, you have to give people optimal opportunities to, you know, see the possibility of change. And, um, and like I said before, um, I don't know who this conversation is going to reach today once it's released, but that's why it is important to you know get these things out because um, it actually leads me to a question that I have for both of you. And then I want to get some into um, the piece that you wrote, um, Julia, which I thought was pretty interesting, you know, about this um, whole idea of people being able to attack different things at once, even though you may have a primary sort of advocacy, you can still do other things as well. Um, what do we, why is it that the Julian Assange um, story, um, what he brought to the table, and by the way, today's the anniversary of his publication, WikiLeaks, to do, it, it's the anniversary, um, I think 17 years. And so um, that uh, Julian founded WikiLeaks on um, October 4, 2006. And um, how appropriate for us to be talking about this today. But what is it about the Julian case that doesn't have headwinds? I mean, people know about it somewhat, but people who follow politics, um, why isn't it that the casual person on the street knows about Julian Assange whatsoever when they clearly probably follow sports, they probably listen to their favorite musician, but they don't know about something this significant in the world of journalism, in the world of news. What, what do y'all think that is? Well, I'll speak first on that. Probably, probably number one or high up would be the media blackout on Julian Assange. And, um, and a lot of, uh, there was a lot of misinformation the past decade on him. They tried to paint him as a hacker. And then the Swedish investigation came up. So he was painted as a rapist. And we've since learned over time um, that none of that is true. He's indeed a publisher. It's on court records here in the United States and um, UK. And they dropped the investigation. It was uh, the UN came out and said it was a nine year investigation, which is a red flag, because if you charge it, he wasn't even charged. But if you allege that he's a rapist, he has a right to defend himself. And he was never given that opportunity, opportunity to defend himself. So like what they're doing to Russell Brand now, it's trial by media and not giving the person. A, there were no charges. So the women didn't want to make charges, but the police pursued it. They put it in the papers, which was another red flag because usually rape victims, you don't put in the victim or the alleged rapist. The, those names are kept uh, secret. So that was a red flag that it was a stitch up from the beginning. So media blackout, media misinformation, and then maybe Julia can talk about what resonates with people. Like a lot of we with uh, Senator Warren, we researched her where she came out because another thing they do is we can't comment because it's an ongoing trial. Well, she commented on the George Floyd. And I think it's because it, it, um, it was real, you know, it was abuse toward a, a, a population of people and it was filmed it was there 
And, and she had the backup of a movement, Black Lives Matter, and everybody was just up in arms about it. And Assange doesn't have that support because it's more abstract. People have a hard time knowing that their press freedom and free speech is being uh, threatened, unless you're on the streets like we are, unless you see the protesters getting arrested. And do you have more to say about that, Julia? Yeah, um, there are a few examples of when politicians have spoken out about Julian Assange, it has been in moments of convenience. So Elizabeth Warren and um, Bernie Sanders and one more senator um, who I'm forgetting, I believe in 2017. Ron when Wyden. The D Ron Wyden. Um, they were quoted in an Intercept article in 2017 um, responding to the DOG's, DOJ's um, charges for Assange under the Trump administration. And um, it's certainly convenient to criticize the other party's decision. But in this case, I mean, it's it was a valid criticism because these charges should not be in existence to begin with. But now that Biden's DOJ is pursuing the charges, we don't hear any of the same criticisms from those same people. It's not as if the case has changed or if any of the facts or any considerations have changed between 2017 and now. It's just that their party is now the one that is covering for the charges. But on the other hand, these days, we're seeing some Republicans um, voice criti criticism of these charges. I think um, Ramaswamy, um, the candidate, has um, most recently said that if he becomes president, he's going to make sure that the charges are dropped against Julian Assange. So um, it's I'm I'm glad to hear someone is speaking out, um, or you know someone with a national microphone is is speaking out against that. But we also have to recognize that um, it's for political convenience, um, and it's hard. It's hard when you're part of it, part of the movement. Like you want you want it to get as much publicity as possible, but it's also hard to to understand that the people who really should be speaking out about it, which are people such as our Massachusetts senators who have built their campaigns around advocating for regular people. Regular people would certainly benefit if their media told them the truth, if whistleblowers were not stifled by not having a secure portal to with which to um, uh, provide their information. That's in the public interest. Um, and so it's quite hypocritical that um, our our leaders who would otherwise support this are silent now that um, Democrats are in charge of the White House and the DOJ. And I think something that you mentioned there is um, interesting. I think it is a lot of this is convenience um, personally because there's a lot of political division and tension in this country. And, and it's been going on for, for years now, especially w when Trump got in. Uh, there was a huge shift. Um, just the rhetoric from people, just there was just a condemnation of the other. I think there's a lot of the othering going on. And so you have people like Marjorie Taylor Greene speaking very positively about Julian Assange. You have Vivek Ramaswamy, like you said. So you have different factions on the two sides, the two ruling class parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, both agreeing on something. And I think that makes people skeptical, like the general public becomes skeptical because these people never agree on something. So why would they agree on something like this? And I think that creates a subconscious doubt in people, even if it is something that's worth like pursuing and fighting for it. it it confuses the people even more because they associate everything negative with this person that they don't like or that person that they don't like. And so they, to them, they say to themselves, how can someone like that have common ground with someone that I look up to? And I think that a lot of that is going on this psychological 
um, warfare stuff is going on too. That's a really, really great point because it breaks people's minds. People that are in that team of po politics, that their team is best, you're, that's a really good point, Kiko. And it leads to the Australian delegation that came in. So um, I think it's uh, two thirds, two thirds of the lawmakers in Australia uh, support freeing Julian Assange and nine out of 10 Australians are demanding his freedom. So they, a delegation of six lawmakers from all the whole spectrum. And that, and it's so funny to listen to video footage of that because they said, we would not agree on probably any other thing other than this. And that's why it's so important. So they were just here September, um, 20th through the 22nd, they spoke to officials at the Department of Justice, the State Department, and several uh, congresspersons. And they that's the point they wanted to make. Look, we're here. We're, we represent all different uh, people with ideologies, different ide ideologies, but this is so important. So, um, and I think they said they had a fairly successful uh, visit and um there you know when you lobby representatives they can't make it public so we don't know exactly who they spoke to other than Ilan Omar did put it on her website she has a press release that she met with the delegation and she re reiterated her support as she did when she signed on the to the Talib letter calling for Assange's um charges to be dropped and and then, like you said, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene came out publicly on Twitter with a whole long thing, and Thomas Massey and Rand Paul, too. Yes. Um, there was another observation that, thanks so much um, for the document you sent me, too. You sent an overall big document, but there's also a special document that the audience is going to learn about later in the evidence files. Um, that Paul has spent so much time into compiling this information. I believe it's 101 pages full of information, um, breaks down everything into 10 main um, chapters. Um, and so we will discuss that towards the end. But I want to say that I, it's perplexing to me that there's also this global South versus global North thing going on right now, because you, as the audience is aware, because we've talked about it several times, where the BRICS coalition that is exploding right now is really the BRICS plus now with Brazil, Russia, India, China, Saudi Arabia, South Africa. But now Saudi Arabia is a part of that. They will be a part of that as of Jan 2024. And then you have countries like um, Egypt, Ethiopia, uh, United Arab Emirates, Argentina. So you have all these countries joining together and some people would say it's economic geopolitical but i think it's interesting that the presidents of honduras of um, brazil and lula da silva and i also think the colombian president gustavo petro all these people see Mara castro as well from honduras i want to give the names like actual name these people they're coming out very publicly supporting julian assange and I believe Correa, who was the Ecuadorian, the former Ecuadorian president, these people are pretty outspoken about Julian Assange in South America. And I don't know if that's because they have a closer proximity with the case, because Julian, that's the thing, too. Um, he's still an Ecuadorian citizen, according to some of the latest stuff I saw. Like That's, that's still a thing, um, because if you go on Wikipedia, it says that his citizenship ended in 2021. In Ecuador, but his lawyer saying um, something completely different. His lawyer is Carlos Povedo. Um, then you have countries like the UK and the US, and you all did document Australia is starting to show support, like even more publicly. But I mean, he is Australian, so you would think that anyway that he would get the support there. But you have a lot of European countries just kind of quiet still, or Maybe it's because they're complicit in the UK, um, the high court decision um, by the magistrate to just, you know, keep him there in Belmarsh and not get extradited. 
And that has his own set of reasonings behind it. Like, why is he still being held up in Belmarsh? Is that even a good thing in the first place? Oh, so he doesn't get extradited here because he's going to face 175 years under the Espionage Act of 1917. Why such advocacy in Latin America, but not in the United States? I mean, we have people like yourselves and we have activist groups coming out in support, but why we don't have really governmental bodies supporting the signs like it should be, I don't think, in a mass scale. These are heads of state coming out in support, but our own head of state is just not doing anything at all. I can offer a hypothesis. Um, I, I'm not a geopolitical um, expert, but I think that um, part of the answer could be that in places in South America, and just by the way, I, I grew up in Paraguay in South America, so I, I'm not Paraguayan, but I've spent a lot of my life there. Um, I feel like there is a healthy dose of skepticism towards policies from the United States because so many countries in Latin America have, um, you know, in the 20th century and beyond, um, have experienced the hypocrisy of Ameri the American um, empire, whether it be um, democratically elected leaders in South America being knocked over with military support from the United States, a country which supposedly wants to export democracy around the world, <laughs> but only when it's a convenient type of democracy for their economic interests. Um, so I, I think a lot of people in, in South America are aware that the United States is saying one thing and doing something else in the case of Julian Assange. United States says it supports freedom of press and, um, and democracy and rights of people around the world, but this is a clear example where the United States is not following its own um, prescription. Um, and it also, I think it also is very clear to others that this sets a really dangerous precedent. This is one country, the United States, deciding that a citizen of a different country, Australia, who was doing work in a completely different set of countries in Europe, was so contrary to the United States's interest that it would go across borders to essentially arrest another country's citizen um, for basically for just doing the job of a journalist. Um, so if the United States can extradite an Australian from Europe to face charges of espionage in the US, any other country would have the precedent to do that as well. Um, and I think from that perspective, it's just so clear how dangerous <laughs> this case is to journalists everywhere, um, and especially um, for countries who know that their own um, geolit geopolitical power is not what the United States is. is. And so if, um, you know, they would have very little means by which to protect themselves after a precedent like this. Yes, Julie, you always hear about human rights abuses in those, quote unquote, the global South countries. Like that, you hear this all the time, this Western rhetoric, and it is absolutely hypocr hypocritical because this is nothing but a human rights situation that we're dealing with right now. And because they're the ones that are the aggressors, I think that's probably has a lot to do with it. But it's interesting because they're always accusing like other parts of the world of, of doing this stuff, <laughs> they're the ones that are doing it, really. And um, I wanted to kind of bring uh, someone else into this that may relate to the Julian K. Sum, because Paula brought up a good point when she sent the articles to me about um, Jamal uh, Hashogi. And um, we know that Jamal was a journalist himself. Um, and I didn't even think about it, I had known about um the, the the situation with with him in Turkey, but 
I, I remember the embassy part with the sons in, in Ecuador, and it makes total sense. Like that, there's definitely a connection. Paula, could you kind of um, elaborate or at least give reference to to what I'm referring to with the journalist that was uh, murdered in Turkey? That that's correct. I don't have all the details either, Kiko. I know that he was an international journalist. He was Saudi Arabian, but he uh, actually, I believe he lived in Washington, D.C., and he was a reporter for the Washington Post, I believe. And um, so he had some meeting um, uh, with the crown prince, and he was there with his wife, and he disappeared. He never came out from the meeting. And then it was learned that he was butchered. He was absolutely butchered. And... uh, by henchmen and his uh and the united states because they're allies with saudi arabia um because of oil and such um never called for justice and he i believe he was an uh, an american citizen he had dual citizenship um, so that talks about the ways of the United States when it comes to politics and holding on to power and resources. And I believe he came up in the news, Kiko, because it's the five year anniversary that he was murdered and uh, no accountability, no accountability with Julian Assange being held all these years um, in, in, a, in Supermax prison. For like Julia said, um, you know, committing the crime of journalism. So, yes, um, and that that leads me to something. As far as Julie is concerned, I alluded to it earlier. So, Julie, you do a lot of climate activism, but what got you? We we understand how you got into the case, but I thought your article was interesting because I read it. And it kind of goes against, I've had this critique of um, not necessarily you, but there's also, there's a there's this sense that climate activists or social justice, social justice activists are so in tune with what they're doing that it's like they can't advocate all the issues. And I think that this is an interesting article. Environmentalists should care about what happens to Julian Assange because um, it does bring up an important point um, when it comes to activism work in general you can do more than one thing you don't have to even if you're primarily interested in the judicial system you can also advocate other issues and and I think that this is a great example of that um, this is an intersectional issue that should attract people in those circles those same circles I think we alluded to this in the first episode we did episode 13 and my audience needs to go back and watch episode 13 and 20 with Susan Malukas, Paula Ayacella, and Mike Miccioli, because we talked about this idea of people being on the streets, for instance, in Boston, and you would think like-minded people would be in the crowd with them, um, holding the signs up and stuff, but you simply see people walking by, and they probably share the same political views, but it's like it's so weird that they're not advocating for this, but they will they advocate for the environment, the climate, or whatever it may be. Um, Can you kind of speak to that, Julia? Like, what got you really, um, what inspired you to even write that piece? Um, Well, I I wanted to um, take advantage of having had a great conversation with the editor of Eco RI. It stands for Eco Rhode Island. Um, And... uh, I, I I really believe that these issues are intertwined because um, one of the biggest um, headwinds that the climate activism uh, movement faces is uh, media silence. That has started to change this summer because there were simply so many disasters, like climate disasters that were in our faces. Um, but up until that point, um, and, and I would say still currently, there's insufficient uh, media coverage of um, the climate crisis and also insufficient coverage of the climate movement. And um, I, I see the challenges that 
Julian Assange faces with media silence around his case, which is really inexplic inexplicable because free media will suffer if Julian Ass has already suffered by Julian Assange's case, but will especially suffer um, if he is extradited to the United States and charged um, or, or convicted um, with these bogus charges. So um, I think there is, like we are experiencing corporate media not wanting to cover things that are inconvenient to our ruling class. And part of that is the climate movement. You can see just as the, um, as one very recent example, the climate march in New York City um, this past September got 75,000 people into the streets at once, all calling on Biden to end fossil fuels. And that got very little coverage from mainstream media. Like, yes, Democracy Now! covered it a lot, um, but I read the New York Times. I did not see much in the New York Times about it. Um, so I think, um, I think the media has a huge role to play in making regular people who are not already, you know, following everything in the climate movement. The media has a big role to play in reporting accurately on what's going on with the climate and also what people are doing in response to the unaddressed climate emergency. And, um, and yeah, it's just, it's devastating to know how even, uh, you know, Biden who ran on the promise of not drilling in the Arctic or on uh, public lands just went right around and permitted more drilling in the Arctic and on public lands. Um, and uh, without a media that is willing and able to investigate how these things come about, like uh, this is an example that I pull from in the article, which was written right after the Willow Project um, came out. Without without protection of whistleblowers, like this type of inexplicable kind of decision um, is kept behind closed doors. Um, WikiLeaks published evidence of the United States interfering in UN um, COP. Uh, I think 15 negotiations um, that ended with there being no real movement towards an international agreement to limit emissions. And we know about that interference because a whistleblower was willing to release that information to the secure portal of WikiLeaks and WikiLeaks published it. Um, and so that is now in the public record, but how much about climate negotiations is not in the public record um, and the climate movement needs that. <laughs> we, we need to know the truth about how our leaders are governing, supposedly in our best interests. Um, but uh, but we all know that that's not that's not really happening because we can see the climate crisis unfolding in front of us. Um, so the, the media is um, is complicit, and um, the mechanism that, WikiLeaks provided as a way for the truth to come out now that its founder has been behind bars for over 10 years. Um, that That is a blow to understanding the truth, not only in climate, but in so many other facets of, um, of our society. So I, I wrote this article because I felt very strongly about both issues, but I also felt how um, Julian Assange's situation is negatively impacting what the climate movement is able to access in terms of information. And it's also chilling the media generally at a time when we need the media to be bold and brave and tell us the truth about what's happening. Um, and not just cater to interests that want us to believe that things are under control climate-wise. Yes, absolutely. And again, I, I appreciate you writing that piece because um, it it was for me out of the norm. Like I, I love to see that kind of stuff. I want to see more of that 
the crossover because that is very possible. Um, if, if you're environmentally conscious, you're obviously, I think, innately going to be more conscious towards other issues, um, censorship, social justice, whatever it may be. So um, that's great to see the acknowledgement. Uh, sometimes we just need acknowledgement of other issues. Um, that's the least that we can do. Um, and, and that's what we try to do in the forum. I, I, I have expertise in certain areas and I don't have as much in others, but I have to bring people on to sort of represent all these different, um, you know, causes and issues. I mean, that's the whole point. And so I encourage people to do that. If, if you're very active as minded, then you can do more than one thing, you know, even though you have a primary focus, like there's nothing wrong with um, taking on several endeavors at once. Um, but I wanted to get one, um, I guess clarification, because Paul has said this about the Ecuador, that the whole idea around Julian's Ecuadorian citizenship. Because I read, I watched that piece that you sent from Consortium News, and they were saying that two out of three of the conditions had to be met for him to be considered a citizen. What is that about exactly? Yeah, I don't have details on that because um, I, I think the vote had to be unanimous and it's what I found interesting about it. They declared they were they were so quick to declare him being stripped of his Ecuadorian citizenship when, in fact, we all knew that it was against uh, their constitution. It was against Ecuador's constitution. And so it's in the courts. There's a lot of things in the courts that aren't being reported, like lawsuits you know, um, people that had their Fourth Amendment rights uh, abused when they visited Julian Assange and they were being spied on by the CIA, by UC Global. And that's in the courts in Spain. Um, it's not reported on. So if it's not reported on, is it true? You know, and that's why the media is complicit in this blackout and the misinformation that's circulating. So there is a lawsuit that's in the uh, Southern New York District Courts um, against the CIA and Mike Pompeo and UC Global for um, um, stripping them of their Fourth Amendment rights because all their uh, devices were opened up and copied. And so that's something you don't hear about. Um, so there are all these little court cases going on. And when I did the evidence files, Kathy Vogan of Consortium News she said, and by the way, Paula, you talk about his citizenship and that, and it's in the courts now. So it was something I didn't know about. And the fact that they're still um, waiting for the decision on, you know, that yes, he is a citizen still of Ecuador seems very likely and hopeful. And uh, I have not heard, I haven't seen uh, an update on that yet, Kiko. So I don't, I, I don't know. What would that mean exactly if, if it's um, concluded that he is an Ecuadorian citizen, does he go back to Ecuador? Like, how does that? That's, that's an excellent question, because we all know that international laws were broken. Mm -hmm. They went into, um, you know, his asylum. They dragged a political asylee out of his asylum. And that's against international laws. And so, you know, but it doesn't matter. It's unprecedented. This case is unprecedented. All the, the laws being broken. When things look like they're going to go Julian's way, they never do because it's just so many laws are broken and it's mm -hmm. a corrupted judiciary. So yeah, I don't know if it's decided in Ecuador that um, indeed he's still um, a citizen. What does that mean? Will Ecuador have rights to, um, you know, bring him to Ecuador, will the case conclude? I don't know. Because per that piece that you sent, um, that's in violation of Article 79 of the Ecuadorian Constitution too. So um, yeah, and people, the people commenting seem pretty hopeful, like if that ended mm -hmm. up happening, then, you know, his jurisdiction would change possibly. I don't know. Um, it, it is, this is so complicated to someone outside um, looking at this because I mean even the legality of, like I was confused the fact that this person is an Australian like we we kept on talking about this like someone is not even a UK citizen or a US citizen 
but these two people have the authority to imprison him when he's not even from those countries. Like that's absolutely crazy. And that's that has to be breaking laws in itself. Mm -hmm. But um you have these like I was telling uh Amira yesterday with the, the whole the Palestine issue, you have these organizations like the internet the International Criminal Court. It seems like they want to enforce things when it seems convenient. They can condemn other countries for what they do, but if it it happens to be one of the allied countries, then they don't touch it, don't talk about it, but they can pursue Putin. They can pursue all these other people that they want to pursue. But for whatever reason, they have nothing to say when it comes to Julian Assange, which it just it gives it gives people just um, this despair and the lack of hope in this um, this system. And I think Susan really alluded to that the last time we talked um, in episode 20. But I did want to um, highlight some of the great work that has been done um, regarding Julian Assange. And I want you to kind of summarize to the audience, Paula, like what this evidence files, um, how did this even come about? Like, I know you've been working on this for a long time because when I saw it on Twitter, when you put it on there, I was like, what is she doing? She's turning the pages and, and I was like, 101 pages. That's, that's incredible uh, dedication and work. And we appreciate it here at the forum. But just tell the audience what that's about, the evidence files. Right. So I've been in this movement about five years. So, of course, my desktop is filled with folders that help me correct the record. So if I see an article come up um, in Common Dreams and he gets something wrong, I can correct the record and send him links to the United Nations, how they ruled on it. And he was, um, oh, geez, Brett Wilkins actually responded to me and he um, he corrected it. And since then, when he reports on Julian Assange, he reports very accurately. So he responded very positively toward my correct the record. So I have folders of evidence showing. And, and so I knew for a long time it would be helpful to collect all these. And my work with Julia and Susan lobbying the senators really made it come to a head because I found... We found ourselves just writing letters and letters and with this article and this new uh, thing that came up, you know, um, proving that Julian's a political prisoner or the injustice. And it just becomes so widespread. And so I started doing bullet points and the bullet points led to, um, uh, I guess we had a meeting with uh, um uh, the state director at Senator Warren's an in-person one. And I promised her evidence that proved that Julian Assange was not a bad player and he deserved justice. And we did that back in the spring, didn't we? Uh, I think it was probably March that I promised that or April? May 1st. May 1st. And so, but it was something that needed to be done a year ago to be helpful for people to advocate for him. So um, I started compiling it. I knew it was going to be a mammoth job. Um, and what, uh, so there are about 15 of us lobbying in April of this year on Capitol Hill, um, trying to get uh, Congress people to sign on to Rashida Tlaib's letter. And so I did a cover letter. And I just want to, instead of going in, to the deep, the, the evidence files is huge. So this uh, bullet point list of what led to the files, I think is very helpful. And it helped me start to organize my thoughts around it. So in my cover letter, when we dropped off Tlaib's letter with these uh, Congress uh, persons, I just said, um, you know, just to follow up on Representative Tlaib, she wrote that Mr. Assange is being prosecuted under, under the notorious and uh, notoriously undemocratic espionage act, which seriously undermines freedom of the press and the first amendment. And then underneath that, I wrote a few facts. Assange's work through WikiLeaks has earned dozens of international journalism awards since 2010. Assange has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize 18 times since 2011. It's actually 19 times now. WikiLeaks has an 100% accuracy, 
accuracy rate. Not one document has ever had to be retracted. A coalition of major press freedom, civil liberty, human rights organizations call for Assange's freedom. It is not true that WikiLeaks dumped information on the internet. Assange carefully redacted and then published on the WikiLeaks website. It is not true that WikiLeaks publications put lives at risk. The Pentagon testified in 2013 that no one was harmed by the WikiLeaks documents. It's not true that Assange helped Chelsea Manning hack into the computers. Manning, an army intelligence analyst, had top secret security clearance to content she leaked and gave to WikiLeaks. Assange is accused of simply doing journalism, possessing, receiving, and disseminating, publishing, classified information which re revealed U.S. war crimes. It violates executive orders 13526 to cover up or classify evidence of war crimes. The Assange case is not just about Julian Assange. It's not even about press freedom. It's about the horrible things being done by our U.S. military that don't, that they don't want citizens to know about. The crime here is not what Assange did. The crimes are what he exposed. And so I made this list and then I realized I have to back it up. You know, there's nothing, you know, I have to show evidence for that. So um, I started what turned out to be, um, it was mostly just a rough thing to give to Senator Warren. But then I dove into it and I said, oh, my God, this is a really serious piece of it's kind of like a book. And you, I wanted it to be good. And Julia said, each chapter needs a table of contents. And I said, oh, my God. <laughs> so she wrote up that for me and really helped out a lot because all these parts that went into it, you know, was just took time and organization. I really liked the forward quote that I put in the beginning after the cover page it was uh, an excerpt from Matt Taibbi. He's a journalist. He wrote an article and then he um, protested at the rally at the UK Parliament. And out of his article, um, that his article was why Julian Assange must be freed. He writes, secrets do not belong to governments. That information belongs to us. Governments rule by our consent. If they want to keep secrets, they must have our permission to do so. And they never have the right to keep crime secret. And that's it. You know, the gov governments don't want their crimes made public. And so what do they do? They go after our truth tellers. So um, so I, I have, there's 10, 10 uh, files. Um, I thought it best to start out with Assange is an award-winning journalist. It's important to everybody know that he's a journalist. So I include, you know, um, documents showing, yes, he's a card carrying journalist. There it is. You know, there's all the awards he's won. So I just tried to use screenshots and links. So it's a really good online tool because it's visual, you see it, but you can also on the PDF, click on the link and it takes you to the article. So I, I just collected, you know, screenshots of uh, Twitter threads on the Espionage Act. You know, um, I learned from Mark um, Michael Tracy on Twitter, he was um, he was quoting from an ACLU uh, amicus brief and that shows that ACLU said, the Espionage Act is unconditionally vague because it provides the government a tool that the First Amendment forbids. And that line is just so many nuggets in here. And hopefully, I'm hoping people can use it. It's on the Espionage Act. Um, let's see, where's my table of contents? I'm sorry. Uh, Espionage Act, WikiLeaks responsible redaction process, evidence that refutes that put lives at risk fallacy, evidence that the CIA spied on and plotted to kill Assange, uh, file five is Assange prosecution is a targeted political selective prosecution because no one else is being prosecuted and they also publish the same material that Julian did. So um, that goes back to what Julia said about the hypocrisy in this case. Um, and the ed evidence of U.S. war crimes that were revealed in the collateral murder video. 
And file seven is the extradition hearing that was never reported. And a lot of that, the testimonies just refuted all the smears that have been um, uh, launched at Assange over the years. File eight was the, um, the political pursuit of Julian Assange and the mishandling of the Swedish uh, rape case, which was just an investigation. Number nine is evidence of Assange's deteriorated health in prison. And number 10 is Assange. It's one of my favorite that files. It's Assange is a political prisoner. The independent judiciary is a fairy tale in political cases. So this came, I saw um, Alina Lilova write a thread about this. And it, I just, it resonated because of the work that Julia and Susan and I have been doing with the senators and how they say, oh, I'm sorry, we can't comment on it. It's an ongoing trial. Well, Alina Lalova's thread dealt with this. She said, this is what author authoritarian governments do when they don't want to report or to, uh, be accountable for uh, having a journalist in prison or that. They say, I'm sorry, our, our justice system, you know, we're, we're, we're letting them take control of it because it's a judicial issue, not a government. And so they use, um, they all wash their hands of it by saying, you know, sending us to the Department of Justice to fight for his freedom when there's nobody there that we can actually talk to. The only people we have to talk to is our state representatives. So that's um, that I really like file 10 because it shows that the United States is very acting very authoritarian by this, by their spokespeople, the White House spokespeople, the State Department. They say, I'm sorry, we can't comment on that. That's the, the Department of Justice. But then Merrick Garland hasn't spoken on it. So it leaves us no one to uh, advocate for his freedom. So. And, and just to put a fine point on what, what you just said, Paula, this isn't even a consistent tactic by politicians because as we've seen, we've talked about before just today, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Ron Wyden already commented on a judicial case, but when it was convenient. And so many politicians commented on um, George Floyd's case, on Roe v. Wade case. And it's easy to comment when people are behind you. Um, just wanting to point out the double layer of hypocrisy on that. Exactly. Julia, I was going to ask you, because I know we have some time constraints. I wanted to um, ask you, what is going on? Like, so so the question is, what now with all the information that we've been um, informed of today and and the listeners? We will link what we can in the episode description as far as the evidence files and everything else. Um, I'm going to link Julia's article as well. And um, any other information you all can think of just. Um, send it over and I'll link it to this description because we're going to premiere this episode at 3 p.m. Eastern today, October the 4th, 2023, um, just so people can get this information out as quickly as possible. But Julia, what can we expect now um, as far as the Assange case? I guess the question is what now? Like what's going to happen next? Are there any upcoming events um, regarding Assange? And, and what are we? What exactly are we waiting on now, as far as like the moves from the courts or or anyone else? I I wish I could tell you, and maybe Paula is better equipped to answer the the forecast for this case. But I can say that just here in in the Boston area, we are um, continuing to. Um, to try to get answers from the staff members of our senators. Um, we've really focused on trying to educate Elizabeth Warren's office, but we're also now in touch with folks from Senator Markey's uh, office. Um, and I think, I think it's possible that because extradition is imminent, because of the Australian delegation visit, because of the Rashida Tlaib letter from the past spring, maybe, maybe our elected leaders are feeling that there is enough pressure that they can't 
continue to pretend that this isn't happening. And so our, our role here in Massachusetts is to continue to ask for meetings with our senators, which every time we ask, we are either blown off or we can meet with a staff person who is a very opaque wall as to what the real position is. But we've gone to several of Elizabeth Warren's town halls to try to speak with her in person. Um, and so we are trying to thoughtfully escalate our tactics to get our materials in front of the eyes of our elected leaders and to um, to make them feel like they need they need to have a response, a public response to this at the very least, even if they're not coming out in favor, they we deserve to know what our leaders stances on this issue, because this will affect our First Amendment rights and our democracy. Um, so I'll I'll hand it over to Paula to maybe talk about more of like the forecast of the case. Well, right. So we're in a, a holding, uh, a waiting period right now. Um, Julian Assange is waiting for the his very very last hearing in the UK. Um, it just seems like a formality. It's a thirty minute hearing for both the prosecution and defense to speak. Uh, he has fifteen minutes to um, try to get the high court judges to save his life. So we think it's just a formality that a uh, hearing date has not been set. Um, they're back in um, session now in the UK. So we're expecting to hear it uh, anytime this month. Um, they uh, organized uh, what they call day X. So that means be prepared, everybody. You're on, you know, you're being warned, pre you know, so Boston has prepared our day X. We're going to go to the, the state house. Um, it's just convenient. Um, it identifies Boston. Um, they're asking people to go to the their British consulate or embassy. Um, in the United States, we have, uh, um, I'm sorry, I just drew a blank. Um, I drew a blank. I'm sorry. I will I'll give this information, Kika. Okay, I'll write it to you. Um, um, that we have our own uh, organizers in DC, Popular Resistance. I'm so sorry, Margaret Flowers. Um, they're organizing their uh, the US version of Day X, and they actually have a pledge, you can, an on site uh, website that you can go and pledge and say, Yes, I'm going to do something in Boston. Yes, I'm going to do something in Denver. And uh, so people are preparing, you know, talking points because if he is extradited, everybody has to be on know what w about the case and what we're going to say about it because there'll be a lot of media on it uh, when and if he's extradited. So um, that's happening. Um, and uh, um, I, Kiko, I will send you all our information on people to reach us here in Boston. Um, to get on our mailing list, uh, we do a newsletter every three weeks. We, we're on the streets every three weeks. That means we have a newsletter uh, with updates. And we'll, I'll give you, if you put it in, in in the links, that would be great. And also encouraging people to call, you know, call, write President Biden, Merrick Garland, and just postcards, anything. It can be simple. Just mean you just say drop the charges, free Julian Assange. That's all you have to say on a postcard, and uh, we will give you there's um, we will give you the mailing addresses for all that in the in the uh, for Kiko to put in the links. And uh, it's uh, it's dire. We're at the it's the end game for Julian Assange right now and our First Amendment. And it feels like and I'm sure Julia feels this. We feel like we're on the beach with a tsunami coming in, you know, the giant wave that's just going to wipe out press freedom and people are sunning themselves on the beach. It's like it's so frustrating to sound the alarm and to be ignored by our senators who know it's a press freedom case because they did come out in 2019 when it was Trump's administration, but are silent now. And that's such a clear indication that it's a political case because like she said, it's, you know, it, it can, you know, it's not politically convenient for them to come forward. And uh, it's frustrating. It's, um, 
Yes, like they're sitting on their hands when this is happening and shame on them. And I agreed with Julia that they need to come out and make a statement for or against it. I mean, we need to know where our, our, our representatives stand on it. And, uh, oh, and I wanted to, I, wanted, I did want to mention one thing that um, Prime Minister uh, Anthony Albanese is uh, due in to have a visit with uh, President Biden. I think I've heard two dates, uh, October 23rd or 25th. And so I know DC activists are planning events at the White House. Uh, they also have a vigil there every two weeks, first and third uh, Sunday of every month. And they're going to do a special one when Albanese is in. And we just have to apply pressure. You know, Albanese could be more forceful. He could get his citizen free. Thank you, Kiko, for having us on. We covered a yes. lot of ground. You, yes, that's, you that's an excellent question about Albanese, um, for sure. I also want to ask Julie, do you have any final words? Um, thank you for your presence. Um, this was your first appearance on the forum. And um, I just want to know if you had any direct words from our audience. Just that I hope um, they use their voices to either follow up with the ways that Paula uh, outlined um, or form their own uh, lobbying group with their local uh, leaders. Um, I think the it's, it's possible that the tide is changing um, on this. Um, and like a very familiar notion from the climate advocacy group is that, um, you know, a few, a few people might look crazy, but the more people who get involved, the more common sense it appears to everybody. Um, and so I think we just, we need more people to use their voice. Um, I think whenever I talk with people about the case, I find that they um, they just didn't know what was going on with Julian Assange's case. And once the facts are there in plain daylight, it's very easy to understand that the charges need to be dropped. So I would encourage folks to um, do a little more reading and it will be crystal clear. Um, and hopefully they feel as um, fired up about it as Paula and I do and also you, Kiko. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, absolutely. Um, it, it is really a, a pleasure to have voices like yourselves on here um, because this is gonna do a lot in helping to inform our audience, um, you know, even more so than they were before. And um, we got to spread this word out, you know, for Julian and hopefully we do get some good news um, because something feels like it's getting closer because um, just the way the press is acting and everything else, it seems like something's just on the horizon. So, um, and hopefully it's good news. We, there's just so much going on in um, the world right now. And um, we, we need some positivity um, whenever we can get it. So, uh, beautiful people, this was a wonderful episode 67. We were joined by Paula Ayacella and Julia Hansen, um, based in the Boston area. And um, tell everyone to subscribe to Kiko's Freethinkers Forum, um, your friends and family, and people who are really um, in the know when it comes to politics. And um, enjoy your beautiful days, and we will talk soon. Cheers. Thank you, Kiko.